Hello, Sonoma Makeup School students, friends, and family. Mary Lou Mandel here with another industry interview. Today's lipstick is more than a powder puff and a lipstick. According to her Instagram and her website, that is her motto. She has worked with Angela Bassett, Denzel Washington, Cindy Crawford, Samuel L. Jackson, and so many more. Her impressive career strengthens her ability as an educator and a filmmaker, and I'm excited to hear all about her career. Welcome to the show, Marietta Carter Narcisse. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou, for having me on. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And you're talking with us all the way from Florida. I know it's very hot over there. So thank you for yeah. taking the time to join me. It's hot and sunny and beautiful outside. Um, let's start with uh, hearing about how you got started in the makeup industry. I got started kind of a, well, actually, kind of a roundabout way. I, I always loved makeup, but um, I never saw it as a profession. You know, and, the, you know, a lot of us are trapped in that dilemma of your parents wanting you to do one thing and you doing something else. And I just always thought it as a hobby. I never even imagined that I could have made money from doing it. Um, and finally, after I got out of college and I worked in the industry as an underwriter, I was like, what am I doing? Am I crazy? I'm, I don't have any fun doing this stuff. So I um, a funny kind of thing happened on my way to medical school and going to work in the industry. Um, I loved fashion so much. And because I sewed, I kind of ended up wanting to do more bridal stuff. I started doing brides. And so I had this great idea. I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to go and enroll in beauty school. And I can tie all the bridal stuff that I was doing together so I could learn how to do hair. Because I didn't know how to do hair professionally. I could do it, but I did not do any chemical work. So I kind of tied my love of all of this stuff together with ultimate dream to be able to do brides, do the hair, makeup, and make the wedding dresses. That's so impressive. So you took a risk. You were on your way to medical school. Mm hmm and you're like, actually, I'm, I have to chase something else. This isn't going to do it for me. I worked in the hospital. I hated it. I just didn't have the same kind of passion. Um, and when I worked in the hospital, everything seemed so separated. All the surgeons sat together. The nurses sat together. The, I mean, it was just very, very, and I didn't like the environment. It didn't do, but I loved how I looked. I loved my nails being done. I loved my hair being done. And, you know, and I kind of figured it out. I read this book called What Color Is Your Parachute? And that really helped me to segment my, 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 my likes, my dislikes, the things that I could do, but I wasn't good at, the things I was good at, but I didn't really like. So it really helped me compartmentalize me as a person and figured out what was missing. So what was missing was being formally trained in hairdressing. I did not do any of that. I got out of school. I built a clientele and stuff. And then I moved. I went to Europe to live. I went to Europe on a one-way ticket, and um, and I traveled all to Europe with my younger brother, who was working with the Commodores at the time. So I traveled, and that opened my eyes to a whole different kind of world that I'd never even really been exposed to. Um, and while doing that, I ended up buying a one-way ticket from Frankfurt, Germany, to Los Angeles. And while I was in LA, I met Natalie Cole through the Commodores. And I had one opportunity, one opportunity. It was like my long shot moment. And while I was walking out the airport with her, because she said to me, are you getting on the plane with them? I said, no. I said, I, I just dropped my brother off to the, you know, that was it. She said, you want to walk out the airport with me? This is Natalie Cole, Nat King Cole's daughter, big and famous. And I thought, oh my God. So I said to her, I said, well, Miss Cole, she said, call me Natalie. And I thought, oh, my new best friend. Okay, Natalie, if you're ever looking for someone to do makeup, hair, and wardrobe, I am available. She said, as a matter of fact, I am. My heart like skipped like 300 beats. I've got chills over this story. That's amazing. Yes, because she said, as a matter of fact, I am. And I thought, you know what? I said, I do hair, makeup, and wardrobe. I could sew with my eyes closed. So there was no exaggeration. And Confucius said, if you can do what you say you can do, it's not bragging. You know, there was no Google, so I didn't have any business cards. Literally, I got a piece of little paper from her and a pen, and I gave her my number. Three days later, her manager called and said, Natalie would like to meet you 
after rehearsal. He gave me the address. I went down to rehearsal. She introduced me to her band. After rehearsal, we went to her um, storage unit. And I picked out about 25 gowns and I rebeated about 25 gowns for Natalie so that she can do on the tour. She loved what I did so much because, you know, it's hard to find individuals who just bead. And especially have gowns that are pre-made. Her manager called me and said, Natalie would love for you to go on the road with her. And I ended up literally flying to Hawaii first class with her. And that's kind of how my career started with doing makeup and doing the hair. And I mean, it literally catapulted me into a whole nother arena that I never even visualized. You mentioned a lot, and we're going to talk about it later, that the importance of diversification of your skills. And because you were like, Miss Natalie Cole, my best friend Natalie, I can do clothing, I can do makeup, I can do hair, I can do all of this stuff, let me know how I can help you. You were able to jump on board and change the trajectory of your life. Completely, completely, because I just did not expect something like that. I didn't expect her response, first of all, but she felt comfortable with me because she had already met my brother. And I knew that they wanted somebody to go on the road with her who didn't smoke, who didn't drink, who didn't do drugs. And I didn't do any of that, Bob, but just clean, you know, nerdy girl. Um, and so it was a perfect fit. And we got along really well. And I saw Hawaii and Canada and a lot of the U.S. with her. And it was wonderful and it was great and it was exciting. But it also opened up myself as a person to look further. And I realized I was doing so many different things, but I loved makeup. You know, after someone beating, rebeating costumes all night long, because, you know, the life of rock and roll, pretty much you live a nightlife. And, um, and I was sitting there watching the movie. And I just literally had an epiphany. I want to see my name rolled in the credits. I literally enrolled in makeup school right after that. Because I didn't know anything about makeup for film. I could do stage makeup. I could do bridal makeup. But I, and salon makeup, but I knew nothing about makeup for film. I didn't know how to break a script down, how to read a call sheet. Th those things were so foreign to me. And I didn't even realize the scope and the magnitude of makeup. You freelance in the store and, and, and you do makeovers in the store, all that stuff. But I had no idea about doing it on a film set. So I enrolled in makeup school. That really opened my eyes to something completely different. And, you know, and the, one of the things that I learned is that you don't really know who's watching you. And while I was in school, my instructors were paying attention to my dedication, my attendance, you know, my enthusiasm. So when people came to the school to look for someone to do work, or they called the school and they wanted someone to come in, and I got recommended all the time. That's how I ended up doing um, the Berlin Opera. Toshka and the Torista. I ended up working on them because I was recommended from the school. And I, again, I met a whole slew of people from Germany. All, everything that they brought in to do that opera came from Krylon. Every single thing. The hairpins, I mean, and all that, those backgrounds came from Krylon. It was just fascinating. They brought in trunks that were larger than life, packed with every single thing. So that opened up. And then, um, then I got referred to do a, a student project from AFI, you know, American Film Institute. Every graduate student has to put on some kind of final project. So that opened my eyes, you know. Um, so I ended up doing a final project, you know. That was literally the only student film I did in my whole career. You did one and then you were off. Yes, literally. But again, you don't know who's watching you and you don't know who has a hand in guiding your direction, you know. And um, so from that, from being with Natalie and seeing the movie and seeing the credits roll, that catapulted and created why I wanted to see my name roll in the credit, you know, in the credits. Awesome. So you did the AFI film. What got you into doing celebrity makeup? After AFI, after doing that, that, that project, I went on a set with my brother. Um, he, we, I was helping him sew Commodore's costumes for the night shift video. And I met a makeup artist the makeup artist who was doing the video, Robin Siegel. He introduced us and Robin said, you know, oh my God, I just paid somebody 50 bucks to watch this. And I thought, 50 bucks, Lord have mercy. That's a lot of money back then. <laughs> and you know, it was like an hour. She went out, she had to do some errands and somebody watched and she paid him 50 bucks. 
and we exchanged numbers. And um, three about three days later, she called me. She said, "I'm doing a Jeffrey Osborne video. I would love for you to work with me." And we literally worked together. The first parts of our resume are like duplicates because I did so much stuff with her. And then I met a lot of people through her. And from that, you know, then you start to build a reputation because when people refer you and you show up and you're punctual, and you're professional, and you do what you have to do. You don't get involved in anybody else's business and you mind your own business. Um, they call you back. And that's what happened to me. People called me back. And um, so I was continuously working. I was, I was busy. I stayed very, very busy, actually. And then I started doing more movies, you know, because I did. I started off with a lot of videos. I did. Oh, I paid my dues in video hell. I did so many videos. Oh, my goodness gracious. I and inhaled so much smoke and did so many 28-hour days, you know. And then you hear the music playing for the next month in your head. Um, so, so yeah, it was, it was quite an experience, but then from that, I started, you know, MTV was really big then. Robin had a hookup with MTV people and she was just with, you know, this production company. She worked all the time. So I worked with her constantly and she kept introducing me to more and more people. And then, um, then an opportunity to do, to work on some films came up and then I started, you know, going in as a third, fourth makeup artist on films. And then I ended up being second and all that kind of stuff. So initially I did makeup and hair because I am a licensed hairdresser too. So initially I did makeup and hair and it kind of built from there. And then I had an opportunity. I did, um, my big break came really after doing these different movies. I did Clara's Heart with Whoopi Goldberg. I didn't do Whoopi's makeup and most people assume that I did Whoopi's makeup because I'm a black woman. She's a black woman. No, I did the white woman. I did her hair and makeup. I did Kathleen Quinlan's hair and makeup. The beginning of my career, I was usually the only black person on set because we didn't have a lot of black people in film at the time. And um, I met Whoopi and we connected. We just had this spiritual connection. Two movies after, I met her again. And we were in Baltimore again doing her alibi. And she was there because at the time her boyfriend was a camera operator. And we just, you know, we just had this bond. When I got back to L.A., we just remained friends. Those movies I did with the help of somebody else. They, you know, they hired me. And I thought, you know, one of, part of my growth is to be able to be hired on my own. That was part of my growth. And I must tell you, I did a lot of affirmations. I did a lot of, I spent my life doing affirmations, and I still do. And part of my affirmations, one of them was really to find my own path. It's great that other people were helping, but to find my own path. And back then, Hollywood Reporter and Variety were quite popular. So I started looking and sending my resume into them. And I thought, oh, I know one day that it's going to happen. I'm going to get a call. And I got a call. And I went in for the interview. And I got hired. And it was to do a trilogy. And halfway through that trilogy, I got a call from Whoopi's assistant saying, Whoopi would love for you to come to Alabama and do this movie with her. It was a movie with her and Sissy Spacek, The Long Walk Home. And I went to the producer who took a chance in hiring me and I was upfront with him and I told him, he said, I will never stand in the way of you building your career because that was the first time I was becoming a person. And I went to Alabama and I did that. And while we were doing that, Whoopi said, well, when we get back to LA, I have another movie coming up and I'd like you to do the movie with me. It was Ghost, the one she got the Oscar for. And I did her makeup for the Oscars and stuff. So it, it's like, you know, that's be careful what you ask for because it most certainly may come through. And that was the thing. And, and I worked, so I spent my career working a lot of my career as a personal. I did movie for two and a half years until I got referred to John Singleton to do Boys in the Hood. And, and I spent my career making sure that I was equipped to do everybody who sat in my chair. I didn't want to be pigeonholed as a black makeup artist. I always wanted to be pigeonholed as a makeup artist, somebody who could just do anybody who sat in the chair. And, and to me, that that's really important for somebody like myself because somebody, they see my complexion and they figure that all I can do are black people. And I wanted them to know, no, I do Jewish people specialize in Jewish makeup? No. I wanted to make sure I was seen as a makeup artist. I fought really hard in Hollywood to be seen as a makeup artist because there weren't a lot of people like myself around at the time, you know? Um, I've been 30 plus years 
in the industry. So I fought really hard just to be seen as a makeup artist, to be called when work needs to be done. That's something I've heard from so many of the industry professionals is you have to be prepared to do any kind of makeup. Any kind of makeup. Even yes. If you are a white makeup artist, you need to be able to do black uh, performers. If yes. you are a black makeup artist, you need to be able to do white performers. You cannot pigeonhole yourself because you are an artist. It's your responsibility to know how to do everything. Right. The challenge, Mary Lou, is that what happens is, as a makeup artist who happens to be black, I could not work in Hollywood if I did not do everyone. Not the same. No, not the because, same. Not the, not the same. same because at the time, and even now, today, 2020, white makeup artists work, can work all the time. They don't ever have to touch a dark face or a brown face. They don't have to. So the kids don't have to be prepared. Now, because people finally realize, we've come to an epiphany where we realize that's not how it should be. We should be diverse. We should be well-versed in skin tones, period. Yeah, that's great. And I'm so glad that it's finally coming to a head. Yes, yes. As, a, time. as an educator who's been teaching, I've taught at a makeup school for years, years and years. I make sure that the students know how to do, they're really no black and white people. They're pink tone people and brown tone people and green tone people and yellow tone people and red tone people, but they're really no black or white people. How to do those tones, how to work on the pink in everybody's skin and not take it out, how to work with the brown and the skin, how to work with the yellow and the greens and all those beautiful tones that we see in the skin, how to make them pop. So that's what I specialize in, teaching you how to make that skin pop, you know, and look like you're wearing nothing. Which is the goal for getting people on camera, especially once like HD came up. Did you have to change anything? Knock wood. Because I was so used to doing skin, I'd still do the same thing that I've been doing when analog TV was out, you know? It's about blending. It's about not having demarcation, you know? It's about taking pride in your work and seeing, training your eye to see what you're supposed to see and what the camera's going to see. It was a seamless transition for me. That's wonderful <laughs> because you have a filmmaker's eye. You're not just a makeup artist. You're not just hair or costume. You are a filmmaker. Yes. And you have produced a movie in the last couple of years so called Joseph the Movie. Yeah. <laughs> and so important, like the diversification. Tell me about that project because I watched a few interviews that you had and it seems like it's a wonderful story. It, you know, Joseph is an amazing story. It's a story about love. It's a story about family. It's a story about sibling rivalry. It's a story about, it shows diverse cultures because we shot it in Jamaica, Barbados, and Ghana. So we went, I went to Ghana. It was amazing. It was such an eye opener. Um, because, you know, they tell you, you don't need to go to Africa. Oh, it was such an eye opener. Um, minus the long trip, because to get, it took two days to get there from Jamaica. But it was just an amazing, to be part of something and to see stuff from a different eye. You know, I'm the one interviewing talent now and hiring talent. So it was a whole different ball game because it's like these are the things that i'm looking for when i go for an interview this is what a producer is looking for so then i flipped the switch and this is what it became you know um interviewing actors and casting actors um via zoom um it was very 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 interesting i took a lot away from that because i see i find that i look we are filmmakers when you work in film and television you're filmmakers you are part of the filmmaking process. It's so much more than just makeup application. You are a filmmaker um, because we tell stories. Our makeup tells the story. Makeup for film and television is character driven. It is not scripted. So what we do is scripted. It's not like fashion makeup. This is scripted. So, you know, uh, uh, somebody from the backwoods of Louisiana who's 35 years old, you know, that's what I'm doing. She's not going to look like this. So understanding the difference. And so we're storytellers. I look at myself as a storyteller. And I thought, if I can tell the stories through my makeup, I can also tell it from the other end as a producer. So it was not as difficult a transition as I thought it would have been to be able to do that. So we have to look at ourselves um, and see where our talent lies in order for us to build as individuals in this industry. And I think it's so important, like we were talking earlier, to diversify yourself because 
one of my mentees right now is an attorney, but she's a makeup artist. And I said to her, I said, you can segue this into entertainment attorney for makeup artists. Makeup artists and hairstylists, they draft contracts. They need to understand how to negotiate and stuff. So you don't have to feel limited. You can marry the two. So I think it's important for us to find synergy in whatever we do so that we can build upon it because gone are the days where it's just one thing. And I think COVID really catapulted that for me because now here we are on lockdown. What do you do? Right, we can't go to set. <laughs> that's right, you build content. Like my little brown book. That's one of the things, Mary Lou, because I realized from teaching, when I started searching, there was not one place that I could go to find definitions a cohesive collection of the definitions of the terms that we use in the industry. You, you can go to camera, blog, and you'll see terms that pertain to camera. But are you gonna see anything else? Nope, it all pertains to camera. You go to a, a grip blog and you see terms that pertain to grip, you know, a baby, a dolly, all this stuff. But there's nothing that tells you the overall dialogue of the industry. And if we're gonna work in an industry, we need to speak the language of the industry. Right. And, and of all departments, because that's something that as, as I've come up, like everything that I've learned, because I didn't go to film school. I just learned from going on to set. And I'm like, wait, what does that mean? What does that mean? And it, somebody taught me to use set ear. So any department that you're in, if you're listening, you can figure out what's going on without having to bother people doing their work. And so I think that this book that you have, it's called Little Brown Book, and it has terminology for every department on a film set is I think such an important resource that all of you should get if you hope to work on a set because you'll learn like what's one in there that you you were surprised by well it you know it, it speaks the language of the set so when I say teamsters or crafty you don't know what I'm talking about if I say crafty, you know? And, and I, re, I had it, I gave it a different, I had it as a different name before and I revised it and I added additional terms because I thought TV, print, film, retail, and then just some of the pop culture terms like eyebrows and fleek. It's like the first time a student said that in my class, the I had 20 some students in the class and the entire class just wanted to see the expression in my face. I was like, eyebrows who what? Eyebrows on fleek. I had no clue what she was talking about. She said, because I, I, I did one of the students in the demo. She said, my gosh, eyebrows on fleek. And I'm like, what? Yeah, exa exactly. It was like, oh my goodness gracious. I had no idea. So I, I, I added a pop culture section to put all these things in because of like, oh no, we need to know what the, my generation needs to know what these things mean, you know? I, I broke down some of the, um, just all things like a montage, a morgue, you know, MOS, because you want to think that MOS means something else, but it means without sound. Local hire, a location manager, lock it down, just long shot, you know, flying through. So I just kind of, everything that I would hear and set, I had written and I had piles of paper, piles of piles, and I finally put that paper in alphabetical order. So I would hand out like 20 sheets of definitions and, and, and terminology. And I thought, that's stupid. So I finally said, let me just put it in book form. And, and, and so that you can put this in your set bag. And while you're on set and you hear something, you can look it up. You don't have to feel like, what's a follow van, you know? What's a four banger? What's a honey wagon? So, so yeah, it's all in here. What an amazing resource. And you also have another book that's a planner for makeup artists specifically. Yeah, and this is yearly. And this this one, this what I call blush. Um, and then on the back, I got creative. I put the movies I've done on the back of this one. Um, but I do it yearly, but it's, it's a 15 month calendar. So it goes from January to the end of March the following year. So I did it so that you could start the year off the first quarter. If you didn't get a planner, you can at least, this goes, you know, for the 15 months. So you could start the year off with the first quarter without having to get a new planner. Yeah, because one of the things that I found in doing this, and the reason I created this is because 
I was putting my own classes together. I used to do a set of classes called Lipstick Lectures. And I realized I was searching for, to put my dates. And I realized IMATS, nobody knew when IMATS show was. They didn't even know what IMATS was. Nobody knew what the makeup show was. And the dates were on the same day. They conflicted because nobody communicated with each other. And I thought, well, that's weird. And then Crystal Wright was doing classes and all the dates were on the same time. How can you attend the industry events when, you know? So I came up with this to put all the industry events in a place where you can look. Say you're going to, you're going to Atlanta, you could see what IMATS Atlanta is if, if it, you're gonna be there, that you can kill two birds at once time. So now you're tricked to visit your aunt can be a write-off because now you're going to a trade show and you're not just going to visit your aunt. So I did it in that kind of way just to help people figure things out. And then I started to expand it and I did a, you know areas for you to set your goals at the beginning of the year, set goals and organize yourself and you know do affirmations. I put quotes in there. I put quarterly um, checks so that you could check yourself to see what you've accomplished the first, you know, every quarter. Um, I have quotes at the bottom and then you can design it yourself. It, I got addicted to stickers. I didn't know there was such a sticker culture. So I started put, I started putting stickers, but then I created something, a trade show checklist so that you can check yourself when you go to the trade show, because if you don't have a plan, you spend too much money. I created a, a, a section whereby you can just put quick thoughts um, and see, and I love, I, I love decorating. So these are eyelashes. So. <laughs> oh my god, that is so true. And I love that it is specifically for makeup industry and because there's not too many publications like I don't know another planner that does that specifically. Well, if you you know what I I did it so that anybody in the industry can use it because I have a checklist here for makeup artists for grooming kits, you know, for men. I have a, a suggested kit that you should put together how to put together your kit. Um and one of the things that I love is that a section for expenses. And, in, and, and income because that's when you're going to be a business you need to keep track of that so exactly. that's wonderful i always say like you need to teach that first is keeping yeah. track of it because you know a part of a, only a small part of what you do is makeup artistry so much of it is about networking about being a business person your ability to negotiate your ability to sell yourself who's gonna hire you if you can't sell yourself you gotta sell yourself and people and, you know when you're coming out of school i always tell my students when you graduate, there's nobody that's going to come and knock and go, oh my God, you just graduated from cinema makeup school. Boy, do I have a job for you. Nope. You got to sell yourself. You got to build yourself up. So many of my former students have stayed in touch with me because I've mentored them. I, I, I you know, I'm honest with them. I don't blow smoke. <laughs> I'm very honest, sometimes too honest, you know, and I, and I, and I, I look at, and I help them look at their own talent and figure out what direction they should go because everybody does not belong in film and television. Some people do better in bridal. Some do better in salon. Some people do better in video. So, you know, there's so many different aspects of it. Some do great in trade shows because they can speak, they can get on a platform. Um, so I look at those talents because we all come with diverse talents. Some are so good in special effects. Some are so artistic. They can draw, they do tattoos, you know, and I try to help them dig deep into their souls to see where, and I find the success comes when you marry your personality with your talent. Film is hurry up and wait. Film is, is monotony. It's monotony. It's, it's redundant. And because a day could take place over six months. So that same makeup has to look the same way for the next six months. If you're going to get bored doing that, maybe you should go into print because then that's going to suit your personality better. I'm not telling you don't do makeup. I'm telling you, you will thrive. It's like the soil you put your plants in, that's how they thrive. And that's what you have to do when you're building your career. You have to take that aspect of your personality and you go out to the end of the industry that's going to suit that aspect of your personality because that's when you will grow. Yes, when you find the right soil to, yes. to grow in. To the right soil to grow in. And I think that that's so important. A lot of students, they go, oh, I'm going to do makeup. Oh, I want to do it all. I want No, because some of them, they do effects and they do it beautifully, but they don't belong on the set. They belong in the lab because they're shy. They don't want to deal with people. So work in the lab. That's okay, too. 
because you'll get to fulfill that end of your dream. And so I find that a lot of it is personality assessment. And when they do that, then they're happy because it's more than just doing makeup. It's doing what's expressive for you as an individual. You define your own success by you as an individual, not by somebody else's. And I think the Instagram and the social media sometimes can put you, you look, oh, this person has got 20, 30,000 followers and I've got 10. I am now at 3,000 followers on my Instagram account. But I realize when I do makeup for a project, I can't post it because it doesn't come with the eyebrows on fleek and all of the above and the, 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 con, the crazy contour and stuff. You look at it and it looks like nothing to you. You're not going to go, oh, I'm not going to send my friend has to see this because I'm also doing a character. So it's not going to register this way when I post it. And I can't post it until the project's ready to come out anyway. So I'm always in a delayed mode. So my following is built organically, not by some craziness I post. Yeah, because you are just showcasing your career in the way that you need to. And like, I, I love social media, but it's also not the end all be all. Right. It's not your self-worth. Exactly. And that, that's what I try to tell them. You can't judge, use that as a judge. And you also have to be able to decipher what's retouch work, what's Photoshop work, or all the above. Because when you say, oh my God, I want to be able to do that. And I've asked so many students come to me and say, oh my God, this is what I really want to do. Well, you can't do it. It's impossible for you to achieve that unless you're going to walk around with a ring light and Photoshop. You cannot achieve it by your human hand. So you got, you have to be able to decipher what you're seeing. Yes. And that's where the difference of like Instagram makeup and film TV makeup or beauty makeup or walk around makeup. It's completely different games, which is fine. They're all interesting lanes. Exactly. But know that they're different. Know that they're different. So, oh, you said it beautifully. They all, they know <laughs> that they're different. Know that they're different. And I also think, you know, for students too, um, one of the things is really assess your skills. Be true to yourself. Learn how to, to, when you can step back from your work and self-critique, you're on your way to being a makeup artist and realize time to put the brush down or time to make adjustments and know when to walk away. That's a big part of your growth in the industry as an individual. Right. And that's something that you really just get from experience. Like experience. The more you'll be able to see, maybe we stop now. Experience. Experience is experience. And practice. School only opens up. It's like the tip of the iceberg. It, it opens you up as an individual to see if this is something you want to continue and pursue. Then you have to take that personality that's you and figure out where you can put it in the different lanes like you just mentioned. Where can I put that personality so I can foster and build myself as an individual in the industry? That's critical to me for, the, for growth. That, that's critical. And then once you get all of that, then you have to say, what skills am I missing that I need to add in order to get where I want to be? And I think that that's something we don't do enough of. We, we all want to get to the top, but are you equipped to get to the top? What skills do I have? What do I need to supplement? Because some of us are really good, but then you might need to go and do a barbering course to be able, because grooming is big. It's huge. It's massive. So you might need to add to that. Or you might shortcut it by doing the full cosmetology course and then take just a small barbering part without having to take all the other hours. So you have to look at those things. Am I well-versed in doing skin tones? Maybe I need to add something else. Am I good in skincare? Maybe I need to become an esthetician so that I can actually learn more about skin. And, and that's something that I hear from everyone is that you, you're, you're essentially, you're never done learning. You're, you're, you're only as good as the last lipstick you use and the last hairstyle you've done in this business. It's a, I, I mean, it's, it's continuous. You're always adding, you stay, you have to stay abreast. I mean, I have taught all over the world. I, I was in Brazil two years ago doing classes for Avon Brazil. And prior to that, I would go to France to teach for Makeup Forever at their film and television academy, which I think they just disbanded. So I would go and teach um, at their, their academy in Saint-Denis, um, just outside of Paris, you know. And a lot of my classes have been on global skin tones, teaching people how not to be afraid of doing really dark skin tones. 
you know, and, and, and teaching them how to figure out the tones and a little bit of history and geography in there so that they could understand why people look the way they look and why this one might have more red and this one might have more yellow or this one might have more yellow green in the skin, that kind of stuff and how to really see them. And, and, and that to me, I love to teach them how to see them, you know, how to see the tones and stuff. And I've been fortunate enough to have such a diverse set of students that I've taught over the years. One class in particular I had, she was from Nigeria and she was the only black girl in the class and everybody else was some, someplace else, but she was the only black one in the class. And that particular, the class said, oh my God, when you go back to Nigeria, you're only gonna know how to do white people. And it was crazy because everybody wanted to do her because of her skin tone, but she didn't have anybody on her skin tone to practice on. And I tell students, I said, you gotta diversify. And if you're in a school that all your classmates are really light and there's nobody dark, you might have a little bit of an issue because a lot of kids I found, like I got a lot of kids in the Midwest and stuff who live in towns where there are no black people or anything. And there were all no brown people or nobody darker than blonde hair, blue eyes to take the fear out of them. And I am so proud of some of the students that I've taught over the years because they can do anybody. No light is too light, no dark is too dark. They just learn how to sit them down without tripping, there are no head trips. I learned how to teach them to take the head trips and get away from the head trips so that they could be comfortable and realize that skin is skin is skin is skin. And when you cut, same old red blood's gonna come through. And when I put them together and show them how to compare, then they could start to see it. And, and see it. so it was like a lot of fun to be able to teach them how to see beyond the surface. What a wonderful mission. And like, I hope that we all, like all artists in every level, camera, light, makeup, all of us understand how to work with all skin tones because we're all here, but we're not going anywhere. Is there any other advice that you have for our students? Anything else you'd like to tell them? I think stick to is the key to success in this business. stick to <laughs> Yes, that's what I call it. <laughs> Stick to it in this. I, I think it's so important because we're in a generation that gets bored very quickly and they want instantaneous results. To build yourself in this industry is not an instantaneous process. It is a step by step by step. And sometimes you go six steps up and you drop 10 steps down. So you have to pace yourself. Every answer is not going to be a yes. There are going to be a lot of no's before that yes comes through. You can't allow it to disappoint you. You can't take it personal. You just have to be persistent and persevere and keep going and keep building. Because just when you're about to give up, as soon as you make that little turn around the corner is when that opportunity is there. But you'll never know it unless you get to that corner so you can make that turn. If you guys would like more information about Marietta's career, you can check out her website. I'll make sure the link is included with this video and you can also follow her on Instagram at Marietta C. And thank you so much for joining me and I hope we can have you at the school to speak with our students sometime soon so they can be sure to be able to cover all the skin tone. I would love that. I'm thrilled about doing stuff like that. Good. Well, then we will try to arrange that as soon as we can. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys enjoyed this, please let me know in the comments and we will catch you guys in the next one. Bye.